When I was living in Columbus, there were two books that really inspired me. There was the Tanakh, of course, and Startup Nation. It just kind of came out when we were living in America. And uh, Tanakh, obviously, was our tradition and God's word and had a very profound impact on, on the lives of everybody who reads it. But Startup Nation really spoke to the Jewish innovation and the miraculous startup nation that was coming from the land of Israel since the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. And I kind of combined those two passions and it inspired me to make Aliyah. Then, you know, Michael, when I saw your book, The Tree of Life and Prosperity, to me, it was like, wow, this is, this is somebody who, who has done so much to synthesize Torah and business innovation. So, Michael, thank you for, for joining us today to talk about your new book. Thank you, Robert Weiss. Appreciate it. Now, you know, I'll let you in on a little secret. My, my heroes are actually Dan Senor and Saul Singer, because I actually don't think there are many people in the history of humanity who have had the fortune to brand a country. And uh, they branded a country in retrospect, but they branded a country. And I think that's amazing. Right. Yeah, everybody knows it is the startup nation. Absolutely. So, Michael, you're a successful venture capitalist and you've invested in Israeli startups. Can you just, but at the same time, at the same time, you're a Torah commentator and you've been writing um, Torah commentaries for many years that are very popular, both in Hebrew and in English. And you're a father of eight. So how do all three of those shape your outlook on life? Well, it, it really starts by being a, a husband and, and married to a wonderful wife, Yaffa, and, and a father. Everything else kind of comes out of that. And family is at the core of our existence uh, as people. Um, I would add, by the way, that the, the Torah, the Bible itself, spends a huge amount of time talking about a family. It starts off as a family, first a bit of a dysfunctional family, Adam and Eve, and two children, one of whom kills each other. And then Noah, which survives the family unit, becomes dysfunctional a bit. And, you know, the Jewish people is a giant family. That's what we are. And family, I think, lies at the core uh, of everything. And children, the next generation, which is, I think, what we live for in general, and the generations that follow us, uh, is obviously at the core of every Jewish teaching, I think any religious teaching, and you know, I would argue at the core of humanity as well. And so that's really the center. Uh, after that, uh, I engage in Torah study, have since I'm, uh, I'm a kid. Um, I enjoy it. I think it's really important because I think, particularly in changing times, which we're clearly going through right now, these are fast, fast changing times. Uh, you need timeless wisdom. You need anchors. You need ethical, moral, and educational anchors to be able to deal with these times. And, you know, that's what the Torah of the Bible uh, provides for me, I think provides for humanity. And then what are we here to do? We're here to make the world a better place. And making the world a better place involves innovation, involves technology. Uh, we feed a lot more people on the planet today than we ever did before. And I think Israel being at the forefront of this whole thing has a chance to bring all these things together, which is, is a family-centric company, everybody, a set country, everybody knows that Israel has the highest birth rate in the West uh, at this point, and certainly among the OECD countries, although that's a terrible measure of the OECD. Um, so we're a family-centric country. Um, I think we're, we're grounded on the values of the Bible, of the Torah, and that gives us a chance to deliver uh, ethical, timeless values and innovation to the world, or innovation grounded in timeless values to the world and, and become a light unto the nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And you talk a lot in your book about the importance of values. And uh, there's a quote from uh, Mark Benioff from Salesforce. And he and, and that building a successful business is the best way to promote your principles. And you know, you talk a lot about the opportunity to invest in you know, ethical investments, which are, are very popular now. And you make the important point that um, investing based on your principles doesn't come at the expense of profits, but in fact is the opposite. It provides a competitive advantage. So I was wondering that when it comes to, you know, you know Mark Benioff and others in, in Silicon Valley talk a lot about ethical investments and 
investing based on principles that you know maybe isn't something that's something that is uh, probably um, a minority but a lot of people talk about that can you speak to the biblical principles that are different than secular principles when it comes to uh, your outlook yeah first of all i think benioff mark is is a unique person really really unique and i think he he, he not only talks the talk he walks the walk on these principles and has really embedded uh, core principles into his business, everything from his one 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 initiative um, to his equal pay initiative to really standing up in the middle of this pandemic for people who are less fortunate around the world and delivering medical supplies. I, I truly admire Mark Benioff. Um, in, in the third volume of the series, which we haven't gotten to yet, on Le- Leviticus, Vayikra, uh, well, I've gotten to it in, in Hebrew, but I haven't gotten to it in English yet. Uh, I really build the foundations of this new economic approach, which uh, I call timeless values create value. And that is, in modern society, we're talking a lot about what you would call ethics and morals, but they are external to the business, ESG, uh, investing, CSR, corporate social responsibility, those are all nice things, but that's like giving charity on the side. It is not a fundamentally new business model. I think what the Torah of the Bible advocates for is something entirely different, which is that the business itself should be built to make money because that is the best carrier, most sustainable way to drive positive principles-based change in the world. And that's what I advocate in this series of books. That's what I try to unpack. And you know, one example we can take from, from Abraham, uh, the question I ask is, what's the difference between Abraham, who was an extraordinarily successful, wealthy man, and Andrew Carnegie, who was also an extraordinarily successful, wealthy man, and perhaps even Warren Buffett, who I mentioned in passing in the book. So Abraham puts the values of taking care of his orphan nephew, the values of calling out in God's name, this kind of faith-based effort to describe a worldview and invest in other people to make them more successful that made him more successful over time. So he advocates for believing that the wealth comes from God. It's not his, but he uses it to invest, for example, in his nephew. And he becomes wealthy along the way in doing that. When you, when you invest in people less fortunate, improve their education, improve their capability, we grow the pie. This is different from corporate social responsibility, which is we take from the pie we've created and we invest it elsewhere. Or even Carnegie, who I, I think made a good step in the right direction, which he says people are wealthy, uh, should take care of that wealth on, behi- on behalf of those less fortunate and therefore invest the money on their behalf and improve their lot paternalistically. And I think that's the big difference, which is Abraham and the Bible empowers others to do well Carnegie takes care of those who did less well. One grows the pie, the other does charity and takes responsibility for all, which is important, but I think is not the same as timeless values creating ever more economic value. Hmm. And, and of course, that fits in perfectly with Sadaka. Jewish charity is all about giving up, you know, the highest level, for example, is not to give to a person to feed them, but even to provide them for a job, right? That's yeah. You know, I'm glad you said that. So uh, you're quoting from Maimonides in the eighth chapter of his laws on, uh, on charity, where he, where he ranks eight levels of giving tzedakah, of giving charity, saying that the highest level is to empower somebody else or to do business with somebody to do it. The question is, where does he get it from, right? Uh, he made it an event. And in fact, the, the Jewish approach to charity, ironically, uh, is not that you give people money. The Torah never says that. It has two forms of charity. One is lending without interest. Why do you provide a loan? You don't just provide a loan because under that money, you provide a loan so they can start up a business. And the second one is these uh, uh, three ways of giving uh, money to the poor. It's not really money, it's goods called in Hebrew, leket shechan peah, which is the grain or the food that was dropped by the farmhands in the field is picked up by the poor people. When they pick it up though, you don't give it to them. Let's think about what this looks like. You have a giant field and they're harvesting the wheat and you have workers there and they drop some and the poor people pick it up. They look like every other worker, right? They're just walking behind the workers in the field and picking it up. So they have the dignity of doing the work 
and they actually have to do work in order to get paid. These are not handouts. If they do not leave their house and go to the field to, so to speak, do work, they actually can't get the charity, so to speak, that they get. Moreover, when you leave over food in your field, and the third one is called payout, which is you leave the corner of your field unharvested so that they actually do the work of harvesting. They need to work to get paid, but you also signal as the landowner that there's enough food. It's abundant. The economy is good. We have enough to go around. And that way we train people to do work. These are not handouts. We don't do handouts in Judaism. We don't. What we do is empowerment. And it's a giant difference. Right. Yeah. And especially today with what's going on with the handout society as an important point for us to consider. I, I want to keep moving because, you know, I know your time is very limited and I have a list of like 100 questions based on like your first chapter. So uh, maybe we'll have time to get into the Torah portion of this week. But um, I wanted to ask you something about that jumped out at me just again in the introduction. You make this comparison that when I thought about it, I was like, wow. I've never heard anybody compare the two. You compare basically venture capitalists to Hebrew prophets, okay, the Hebrew prophets. And what you read is like this. You said, naturally, venture capitalists are optimists who believe in technology's ability to create a better future. So it's only natural that I connect with the utopian visions of the prophets. And uh, for a lot of people who are maybe watching this, number one, they're familiar with the Hebrew prophets, probably a little less familiar with venture capital. Can you explain like what are you getting at here? Could you just unpack that in a little bit more detail? So the real heroes of innovation and, and, and moving the world forward are actually the entrepreneurs. They're in the day-to-day. -day. These guys innovate, they invent, and they create a better future. But being in the day-to-day -day is, is hard, and it's got a lot of tedium uh, involved with it. And it's you can get kind of... Uh, bamboozled or moved from side to side by the pace that things are moving at. And I think that's similar to a king or a business leader in ancient times who, who's in the daily grind of this, uh, has got a lot of pressures on them, and is trying to move the ball forward. The prophets were like the people who reminded the kings, you know, what's right and wrong in that time, or how to stay the path, or here's the big vision out front, even if you're in the daily grind, we can get there. And I think the job of the venture capitalist who is not as burdened by the day-to-day -day grind that the entrepreneurs are, like I said, they're the real doers and heroes, uh, are as a chance to keep an eye on that big vision out there, uh, how the world gets better, how the business grows to be really big, how you kind of uh, can have world-beating uh, innovation, do amazing things, and at the same time kind of remind about the ethical principles that we need to stay true to as we go along that journey. Okay. Okay. Now, but you, you take it even a step further, right? You kind of make, you throw out this comparison that the venture capitalists or the entrepreneurs in our generation are like the Hebrew prophets um, in ancient times and uh, to remind us sort of our moral responsibilities. And then you take it a step further and you talk about how, you know, thanks to technology and thanks to morality and principles. So that could lead to, or hopefully will lead to a, you know, an Isaiah chapter two vision where nations will not lift sword up against nation. And, um, and you know, again, as somebody who um, made Aliyah, like, or like yourself, made Aliyah as a religious Jew because of our belief in the truth of the Bible, the truth of God's word and the truth of the Torah, that the promises of the Bible, that the land of Israel will be restored and that the people of Israel will return to the land of Israel. And that will lead to this redemption for all of the world. So can you explain, and, and then you say something that I really wanted you to, to talk about, where you say that you know, throughout history, our relationship with Torah was a relationship where we had to build a lot of safeguards in order to protect the Torah, uh, stringencies to prevent us from stumbling, right? And then you say how when moral principles manifest in every step, perhaps we will be able to remove the prohibitions and safeguards that were added out of concern. And so, you know, can you talk a little bit about this new reality that you are trying to build? Now I understand your question a little better. So. Uh, let's, let's maybe back up. Uh, until there was Jewish sovereignty, the Jewish state, 
Judaism and even the Torah, it existed in daily practice, but its core ideals for a society, for an economy, couldn't be implemented. And its own unique economy, you know, I think we came back to Israel 70 years ago, not only to create sovereignty, but to create a different kind of country, a different kind of economy, a different kind of governance structure. And we're on a path, right? And to my mind, this move from farming, which is important, by the way, needs to be maintained because that's our connection to the land and maybe even grown to an innovation economy, which is exportable, which is ephemeral and can travel across borders is critical to exporting whatever it is that we have to offer. And it's not just innovation that changes things, um, the way people interact. So I'll, I'll give you an example in a second. But it's also the timeless values alongside of that. And I think this has redemptive power. If we think about the notion that technology is able to feed 9 billion people around the world, you know, Thomas Malthus, this doctor of doom, so many years ago, thought we wouldn't have enough food to feed the world a couple hundred years ago. Here we still are with about five or six X the number of people in the world. So technology does work to make the world a more hospitable and better place. War is down if you look at the uh, time in history. So we're all on the right path. And I think technology contributes to that. But if you look at the types of companies coming out of Israel, I think you see something dramatic and this ability to kind of spread it digitally work. So I want to talk about a, a guy named Yonatan Adiri. Yonatan Adiri is the founder of a company called Healthy IO. And his mom had a fall in China when she was on a trip there. And uh, he couldn't get the medical records or, or, or anything. He said, this is nuts. We're carrying supercomputers around our pockets called smartphones. And I can't get medical tests done or I can't get results. That's crazy. So he said, Okay, I'm going to get to work. These phones are getting a lot better. He called it the selfie economy. Um, people want to take selfies, so the phones and the cameras keep getting better. He said, okay, I'm going to bet on the camera getting better. How can I apply it to medical diagnostics? And he settled on urine tests. And he said, no, urine tests are a royal pain in the neck. you got to go to a lab, make an appointment. It takes hours. You drive, you come back. So, well, what if we can do this at home on our smartphone and just use the camera to take a picture? And he said, that will save lives. So I'm going to start a company that will help people uh, intercept chronic kidney disease before it happens, CKD, uh, help women who have UTIs, urinary tract infections, get access to diagnostics from their phone. And he built this timeless values-based company on the Jewish principle that he who saves one life saves the world and making it more accessible. And now they're spreading digitally. We're in the UK and Israel and in the Netherlands and the US now, and it's just spreading. And I think it's amazing. And you recruit people, let me just finish the one sentence, very important difference between the industrial economy of the 20th century and the 21st century digital economy. 21st century industrial economy is about machines. The 20, 20th century industrial economy is about machines. The 21st century digital economy is about brains. Machines have no hearts. Brains all have hearts. So this is innovation with the soul. And if you want to attract the best and the brightest brains, you got to talk to their souls because they want to work on important problems. Right. And, and I think that, you know, is something that Judaism is just starting to come to grips with. And, and it's, it's great that you, you're are such an articulate spokesperson for this new reality that we have to build here, that we you really have to. You know what always struck me? You know what always struck me always? When I was, the first time I learned the prophet Zechariah, Zachariah, he describes what utopia looks like in Jerusalem. And you know what he says? It's old people sitting in the streets of Jerusalem with kids running around, playing in the streets. And I think about that. It's a very real vision. This is not some kind of out there Garden of Eden thing. It's very real. Grandparents and grandchildren sitting and playing in the streets of Jerusalem. And it's about the bounty that comes from the crops, right? Mm -hmm. the prophet Joel, right? The second paragraph of the prophet Joel, right? The bounty that comes from the crops when we have this redemptive spirit that comes after a fast and repenting. And I think there's something very physical and real and familial about it. And that's what we're after, I think. Right. And, and I just wanted to kind of conclude with you, you talk about this utopian vision where there will be no more conflict, no more war, no you know, competition, but a healthy kind of competition. And you yeah. quote, of course, from Isaiah 2. And I just need to point out that the previous verse in Isaiah chapter 2, where it says the word of Isaiah prophesied concerning Jerusalem and Judah in the days to come. 
that Jerusalem will be in a position where the whole world will look to it. It will stand firmly above all the other mountains. Vinaharu elav kol hagoyim. All of the non-Jews will look towards, will seek out Jerusalem and will gaze upon it. And many people will say, All the nations are going to finally say, instead of putting down the Jewish people, and persecuting the Jew- Jewish people, they're gonna say, let us go to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways. For the word of God will emanate from Zion and the word of Hashem from Jerusalem. And then it says, and then it says the verse that of course you mentioned, that nation will not take up sword against nation. And, you know, we're living in such an amazing time where so many non-Jewish people are able just to, you know, see the wisdom that the Jewish people have, see the miracles of the, of the startup nation, and to gain inspiration and to uh, connect both with the people of Israel, the land of Israel, like it says in the end of days. And hopefully our Torah and our innovation and our life-saving venture capital entrepreneurship will make a huge impact and will go forth from Zion. And that is really, like you said, that is the word of, of God. That is the Tavar Hashem in our generation. So, Michael, where can we find more information about you and your book? Uh, so if you uh, Google Michael Eisenberg, Israel, the Tree of Life and Prosperity, the book, uh, you'll find plenty of information on me. The book's available on Amazon, on Barnes and Noble, uh, and everywhere else. And thank God it's been selling really well. I did a couple of number ones. Uh, and uh, I, I think, you know, part of that is, is that the timeless values that undergird innovation are, is connective tissues to all peoples of the world. And I think that's a really uh, important thing that's emanating now from, you know, the land of Israel and, and something important for all of us to be able to make use of and relate to and build the values into this right now. So thank you for having me. And uh, again, it's a tree of life and prosperity. And, you know, if anybody wants to reach out, I've been responding to a lot of emails. So I love that. All right. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.